Hi, and welcome to the Ministry Network Podcast. I'm your host, James Baird. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Leland Reichen, the celebrated professor of English at Wheaton College and the literary stylist of the English Standard Version. Dr. Reichen is the author of numerous books, including The Soul and Paraphrase, a treasure of classic devotional poems. Dr. Reichen will share with us today his principles for interpreting the Bible as sacred literature. The Ministry Network podcast is sponsored by Westminster Theological Seminary. To learn more about their new online degree programs, visit ministrynetwork.com forward slash degree. Now, let's talk with Dr. Riken. Well, Dr. Riken, thank you so much for joining us on Ministry Network. I'm glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a Christian? I come from very humble stock. Right to the present day, I self-identify as the farm boy from Iowa. I grew up in central Iowa in unsophisticated surroundings. Only recently have I come to the conclusion I grew up in an immigrant subculture. The subculture was Dutch. My grandparents all came over from the Netherlands. Neither of my parents finished grade school because they were needed to work on the farm. Despite all that, I think I was very privileged in my upbringing. I would regard my parents as well-educated because they were readers. With every passing day, I am more grateful than the day before for my upbringing, the Christian school education, the church attendance. It was just a wholesome community in every possible way. I came to full conviction of salvation during my sophomore year in high school. It happened mysteriously overnight, and that accords well with Jesus' statement to Nicodemus, the Spirit blows where it wishes. I was fully educated in the Christian faith. I went to bed one night not knowing that I was saved. I woke up the next morning knowing I was. So that was my in a sense, conversion experience. It was a confirmation of the knowledge that I had. So I heard you mention that your parents were readers. Would that be one of the sources for how literature became such a huge factor in your life? Yes, it definitely is an explanation. We ransacked the public library. But I have to say, my calling as a teacher of literature is something I somewhat fell into. I was just following the example of an older sister who was destined to be a high school teacher of English. I just assumed I would do the same. But God was working in that. It has been in every way the right fit for me. Hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about your career teaching literature? What has the shape of that journey looked like for you? I am in my 51st year of teaching at Wheaton College, if you can imagine. It's a matter of cultivating my garden. I am very much of the opinion of Jeremiah's advice to his secretary, Baruch. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. I did not seek great things for myself. I cultivated my garden. I entered pretty much every door that was open before me in terms of publishing possibility and speaking. By the time the books that are currently under contract are published, I will have published 60 books, if you can imagine. How did it happen? It just happened by my entering the open doors. I have published in many different fields. That has given me an entry into many different circles, and that's really been rewarding. Early in my career, I decided I have a writing career as well as a teaching career. So I have never worried about what my discipline calls or the academy calls publishing in my field. I have published on whatever topic presented itself to me, and it's really been a rich experience. Well, I'd say that you're probably best known for your publications on reading the Bible as literature. Could you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yes, I want to divide that into two different subjects. The one subject is, what does it mean that the Bible is literature? And I will address that. The other is, well, then what does it mean to approach the Bible as literature? And that is a separate question. The great frustration to me in my half century of writing and speaking on the Bible as literature is that people are convinced that the Bible is literary. They give assent to that. 
But it turns out to be lip service because when they come then to interact with the Bible, they fall back on the conventional approaches to the Bible. I have so often had the experience of a minister coming to me after the service as we're engaging in talk and saying how much he benefited from what I had written on that passage or that genre. I have to say, I didn't discern any influence. It's as though the person, having read what I said, assumed, I infer, that whatever then he does with the Bible must be an application of that, but it isn't. So this has been a great frustration, lip service. So what what does it mean that the Bible is literature? Now, literature has several traits, so I'm, I'm going to keep it as simple as I can, but it, it's going to be a multiple answer. The most obvious thing it means that the Bible is literature is that the Bible comes to us in literary genres. A genre is a type or kind. The two big ones in the Bible are narrative and poetry, but it's not limited to that. For example, visionary literature ranks as a major segment of the Bible. The epistles are a genre. The point about a genre is that it has its own rules of operation, and we need to understand and apply those rules of operation in order to deal with the Bible as the book it is. So literary genre is one answer to the question, what does it mean that the Bible is literature? It comes to us in the form of literary genres. That's a matter of form, literary form. Well, then what about content? And again, I have multiple traits here. The first trait of literature is that it is concrete rather than abstract. Literature is not a delivery system for an idea. It is an incarnation of the subject. Now, the cliche in literature courses and creative writing courses is the following. Literature shows rather than tells. And that's a useful formula. To tell means to state abstractly and propositionally. To show means to embody and incarnate. Let me take the story of Cain as an example. The Sixth Commandment tells us you shall not murder. That constitutes telling. The story of Cain embodies that same truth, but it doesn't even use the word murder. It doesn't tell us to refrain from it. Everything is incarnated in the story of Cain. So that's a trait of literature. It embodies in concrete form. Then I want to add a related trait Right at the outset of my college career as an English major, I encountered the idea, the subject of literature is human experience. Well, it is. That formula has never failed me. The subject of literature is not ideas. It is human experience. The the writer presents human experience for our contemplation. We come to see experience correctly. So I, I would speak of knowledge in the form of right seeing, not an idea that's true. I certainly value ideas that are true, but the kind of knowledge that literature and the arts convey is different from that. It's representational truth. It is getting us to see and experience human experience. And a final trait of literature, since I'm keeping this simple, is literature is an object of art. It shows craftsmanship. That catch-all aesthetic term beauty is one that I have always used. Skill and craftsmanship. That's an element of literature in the Bible and beyond that is self-rewarding in itself. I'm fond of a statement that a student put on a paper. If God didn't neglect beauty when he created the world, why would he have neglected it when he gave us the Bible? That is a true statement. I'll just add, literature has a multi-layered quality. So much of the conventional approach to the Bible is reductionistic. Back to the subject of genre, I don't want the comment I'm about to make to seem more combative than it is, but I can count on one hand the preachers and Bible teachers that I have sat under in the last five years who have done justice to the literary genres of the Bible. Every passage is treated in the same way as some kind of universal nondescript genre. A repository of ideas is the chief way in which it is presented The primary task of a Bible expositor or reader is to relive the text as fully as possible and in terms of the specificity of the text. So let's just take story as an example. What greets me as I begin to read a story? Not an idea. 
plot, setting, and character are the ingredients of a story. To interact with a story, we have to use those terms and apply those categories. And in the circles in which I move, it just isn't done. I don't hear about plot, setting, and character when the text is a narrative. So if I was going to summarize your points, when you ask the question, what does it mean that the Bible is literature? The answer is, one, it's determined by different genres. Two, it's about incarnated experience. And three, it's layered. Did I miss any points there? Yes, the, the idea that it's a thing made. It's, it's the object of skilled craftsmanship. The storytellers in the Bible knew how to tell a story with suspense. They knew it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. That it was structured as plot conflict moving to resolution. The poets of the Bible mastered the poetic idiom. They spoke naturally in imagery and figures of speech. These things are objects of beauty, the product of craftsmanship, and that adds a layer of enjoyment or a dimension of enjoyment to our reading of the Bible. Dr. Riken, can you give us some more specific examples of how reading the Bible in this way uncovers some of the gems and different scriptural passages? Yes, I'm going to surprise you by answering it as follows. Every literary passage in the Bible illustrates the way in which it will unfold its meaning and beauty when we approach it as literature. So let me take Psalm 23 as an example of poetry. The moment I begin reading, the Lord is my shepherd, what I need to interact with is the imagery of the shepherd's life and the metaphor in which God's care for people is compared to the care of a shepherd for sheep. It will yield its meaning if we approach it as a poem. And conversely, if we do not approach Psalm 23 as a poem, we're not doing the right thing with it. And we're not getting the fullness of meaning from it. We're reducing it, probably, to an idea. So really, every literary passage in the Bible illustrates how literature reveals itself. It conveys what it's there ready to offer us if we approach it in the kind of writing that it is. That's really helpful. And I can think of certain genres, like the epistles, for example, where the conveyance of ideas does seem to be a key part. How does that factor into your literary model? I would say the epistles are not as clear-cut an example of the incarnational nature of literature as a story or poem. Nonetheless, the epistles will yield their meaning if we approach them in literary categories. An epistle is not just like the letters that we write, but it is similar to them. To approach the epistle as something other than a repository of ideas requires of us that we apply epistolary conventions. And one of those is that an epistle is not a treatise. It does not have a controlling thesis. It is ad hoc. It takes up the subjects that have been raised. So it is not systematic and it is not seamless from one paragraph to the next although that is commonly imposed on the epistles, they have lifelikeness. They skip around. They take up everyday issues in the church or beyond. They are the voice, the authentic voice of human experience. They are not as ideational as we have been led to think. I do think that they are more ideational in their content than a story but they have the literary trait of being experiential. Additionally, almost every page in the epistles springs images, metaphors, similes, and such like on us. So they do use a poetic idiom. Dr. Riken, how would you relate the Bible as literature with the doctrine of inerrancy? I could imagine that some might see the literary nature as the Bible as a reason to deny inerrancy. Is that your position? And if not, why not? No, not at all. In fact, one of my defenses of the literary approach to the Bible is that God inspired the authors of the Bible to write as they did. If they gave us a book replete with literary form and a book that conveys its meanings by literary means, then it's a fair inference that God moved or inspired the writers to use literary terms. 
I would also invoke a cornerstone of evangelical hermeneutics, namely authorial intention. Let's take it seriously, I want to say to biblical scholars. It's a fair assumption, surely, that the book we have is the book that God moved the writers to write. Well, if so, then the literary forms of the Bible were also inspired by God. They are what God prompted the authors to write. So far from impairing our belief in inspiration, but therefore infallibility, we begin with the assumption that God did give us the book he wants us to have. If it's very literary, then it's an inference. God inspired the literary form of the Bible. Well, shifting a little bit here, Dr. Reichen, can you tell us a little bit about your work as the literary stylist for the ESV? Yes, I find it hard to even imagine my life, and likewise my wife finds it hard to imagine our life without the place that the translation of the ESV played in it. It was just so enriching over a period of a decade. Yes, I bore the title literary stylist, but all of the men on the committee were good stylists. They just were. So that I think it's a little misleading for me to be called the literary stylist of the ESV. There were certainly occasions when I was the guardian of grammar and stylistic felicity. I served the committee best by being an informed general reader. I raised questions that the specialist doesn't think to ask. So that was my primary contribution to the ESV. That um, sounds like a very humble way to put it, but I can say that I know all those other men that served on the committee with you were extremely glad for your input and couldn't have seen it move forward without you. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a few of the passages that you worked on as a literary stylist that you found particularly challenging or particularly enlightening in a way that perhaps you hadn't noticed before when reading the passage. I can't think of examples of that offhand. I will just say that I won some votes and I lost some votes, but that was true of true of everyone. Let's say Vapor of Vapors, which I think should have been the translation of that formula that appears 30 times in Ecclesiastes, because that's what it literally says, Vapor of Vapors. So I lost that vote. I pretty regularly was able to steer the committee in a a literary direction. With Psalm 23, I think I was influential in retaining more of the pastoral imagery rather than less of it. One of the votes I won is that the word used in the story of Ruth, wings is the word. And in the RSV, when Boaz says, I know all about your good reputation and how you have come to take refuge under the wings. That same word appears in a Ruth's request, spread your wings over me. And in the RSV, it was spread your garment over me. So that was a small triumph. I got my way on that one. Dr. Riken, can you tell us a little bit about how reading literature should factor into the Christian life? Well, I'm an enthusiast for literature, as you can imagine. Literature serves two functions, refreshment and edification, and it can contribute those two things to our lives. Now, I want to steer clear of laying a guilt trip on anyone along the lines of a person's needing to spend a lot more time with literature. I don't believe that. I think we need to set modest goals. A chapter from a novel per day three chapters per week is very refreshing and very edifying. We don't have to set aside vast time in order to reap the benefits of literature. On those two criteria, I find myself choosing to read some works on the basis of edification. I'm seeking edification, and I know the work will give it. With other works, I go to them seeking entertainment or refreshment. That's just a comment on what prompts me to read this or that work. I find that I experience both of those qualities, refreshment and edification, in pretty much equal amounts, regardless of which of those two prompted me to read a work in the first place. I think literature has a lot to offer us, but we have to take the step of a small beginning. And again, let me say, A modest commitment of time will yield really big benefits and dividends with a truly great work of literature. 
Would you mind telling us a little bit more about what you see those dividends and benefits to the Christian look like? The benefits are along the lines of what we've talked about in regard to the Bible as literature. Literature can be trusted to give us the authentic voice of human experience. In fact, literature as a whole is the human race's testimony to its own experience. Well, it's very valuable for a Christian to be put in contact with bedrock human experience. It's one of our bonds with the human race. We have to guard against disparaging what is human in life and in human experience. Literature will put us in touch with bedrock human experience. So that's, that's a big dividend. It gives us knowledge in the form of right seeing. We're seeing human experience accurately. That's very valuable. We need it to negotiate life. Then on the entertainment side, literature, if it is good, is an enlightened use of leisure time. And leisure is a Christian calling. God expects it of us. He commands it. I'll just say, by the way, that when I have written and spoken on leisure, I make the claim that the Bible says just as much about leisure as a calling. It's just harder to find the data, and we have to do more inferring. But it is something God expects of us and calls us to. Well, literature offers some really good possibilities when it comes to enlightened leisure. I'm fond of the statement of a Christian leisure theorist who calls leisure the growing time for the human spirit. That's what it can be, the growing time for the human spirit. Can you share with us a few of those data for the importance of leisure in the Christian life that appear in Scripture? Yes. I want to begin at the broad level. What do work and leisure share? They are both Christian callings. They are things that God commands and expects. Yes, leisure is not as overtly taught in the Bible. We have the example of God in the creation of the world, rest as a required part of the rhythm of life. We have the Old Testament festivals. They were mandatory occasions of leisure. This Feast of Tabernacles lasted a week. It was a camping experience. Uh, Jesus' discourse against anxiety in Matthew 6 I think, is a great text that prompts us to believe that life cannot consist only of acquisition. It needs to also consist of a letting go of the acquisitive urge, of enjoying what God has already created. Wow, I have to say that I've, I've never thought about leisure that way. Dr. Riken, what two pieces of literature would you encourage pastors to engage, and why? I'm a little hesitant to recommend specific works. I will in just a minute. But my advice is along the lines of the proverb in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Now, here's my application to reading. Read any good piece of literature that crosses your path. Give yourself to it. It doesn't have to be a big outlay of time, as I said. It can be broken into modest segments. For anyone who's getting into this and needs a starting point, on the narrative side, I would recommend Leo Tolstoy's novelette, A Mere Sixty Pages, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. That's the work that baptized my imagination in the sense of showing me how thoroughly Christian a work of fiction can be in its intention and impact. And then a good follow-up would be The Hammer of God, written by a very leading Swedish churchman from the middle of the 20th century, Bo Geertz. It's actually three novelettes, but they read like a novel because each of these three traces the first two or three uh, years in the life of a young minister arriving in the same parish. So it's a rural parish. That's a good starting point for anyone who wants to get into poetry. I am frankly going to recommend my anthology of devotional poetry consisting of the poems that I teach in my English classes, day in and day out. The best of the best, devotional poetry, that's a good place to start for a Christian reader. It is thoroughly poetic. The poems in this anthology are accompanied by 500-word explications, so it's like sitting in a college classroom. That would be an excellent way to ease into introducing poetry into one's life. That volume titled The Soul and Paraphrase is one of my favorite books. 
It is so helpful. So thank you for that, Dr. Reichen. Let me just add, poetry can be intimidating. So let's start with the non-intimidating. I have published, again, an anthology of familiar hymns considered as devotional poems. Every hymn begins as a poem, again, accompanied by 500-word explications. That's an easy way to feel non-intimidated by poetry, familiar hymns as devotional poems. Dr. Reichen, on this note, which of your publications would you recommend to a pastor who's trying to approach the Bible as literature, maybe for the first time? I would recommend two books. One is How to Read the Bible as Literature. That gives the methodology. It's a short, readable book. My bigger book, Words of Delight, A Literary Introduction to the Bible, does include the methodology, but it includes explications of texts. I would recommend a third book, The Literary Study Bible, which I have edited with my son, has been out of print for a decade, but it's being relaunched this very month, the Literary Study Bible. It includes literary commentary on every passage in the Bible. It's a reader's Bible. It's not a reference book. It's a reader's Bible at the head of every passage, every chapter or segment or poem. Written right into the text is a block of tips for reading. It will give you the structure of the passage, but it'll give you the literary techniques that you should be looking for and that will convey the meaning of the passage. So that study Bible will come out with Crossway, is that correct? That is correct. Wonderful. Well, I sure do hope our listeners will grab a copy of that. Dr. Riken, I just want to say that personally, your literary approach to the Bible has transformed how I study the scriptures on an academic level, but also just read it devotionally. In particular, I want to say that it's helped me understand what it means to apply the scriptures practically. Oftentimes, whenever I would use some of the more traditional methods, I would look for the core idea that a passage was trying to convey, and then I would try to say, what does that core idea mean for me practically? And that's a difficult line of reasoning to follow. But whenever you showed me that the Bible as literature means that it is incarnate human experience, it immediately drove me to, what is this passage encouraging me to see? And what does that mean for who I am or who I should be? And that is just transformative in terms of connecting biblical theology to practical theology. Fantastic. You know, this this idea of literature being authentic human experience. And um, I could have gotten into archetypes, but I think that's too technical. But it's easy to show the universality of literature. It deals with the great master images that are always coming up. So, yes, that's application, definitely. Dr. Riken, it has been wonderful to welcome you here onto Ministry Network, and we hope to hear again from you in the future. Thank you very much. Join us next time as we talk with Dr. Stephen Nichols. In the meantime, visit ministrynetwork.com forward slash degree to learn more about the new online offerings available at Westminster Theological Seminary.